This Torah 101 podcast is sponsored in honor of a dear friend of mine, a dear friend of Torch from Dallas, who wishes to remain anonymous. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much for your friendship. Thank you so much for your enthusiasm. I really appreciate you as a friend, and Torch is fortunate to have you as a supporter and as someone who wants to partner with us in our efforts. If you would like to support Torch, or if you would like to support the Torah 101 podcast, or if you have any questions or comments, send me an email, rabbiwalby at gmail.com. In our efforts to try to understand Torah in its entirety, in the whole scope, and see the big picture, we discussed the history of the oral Torah, why it was written, how it was written, the Mishnah, the basic laws, the Talmud, the various aspects of the Talmud, the halachic portions of the Talmud, the agatic portions of the Talmud, how that is all culled and crystallized into the halacha. And today, I want to continue this discussion with the next natural component of Torah that we need to discuss, and arguably the most misunderstood portion of all of Torah, namely the Kabbalah, the hidden, mystical, secret parts of Torah. Now, we did address it briefly when we spoke about Agatha. We talked about how some Agatha teachings are Kabbalistic, and they had to be written down, but they were written down in order to not be forgotten, but they're written down cryptically so that only the people that have the keys to unlock it will understand it. So we did address it Briefly, and today I want to discuss the subject at length. Now, I want to make an important disclaimer from the very beginning. I want to make it clear that I do not profess to be an expert in this subject, and therefore I'm going to make an extra effort to be precise and to quote from primary sources as I understand them on this very important and very misunderstood, a subject rife with all kinds of misconceptions and misunderstandings and imprecisions, I'm going to try to be as precise as I can. So what is the Kabbalah? What is this mystical part of Torah? So according to tradition, Kabbalah is part of the oral Torah. Moshe goes to Sinai, he gets the Torah, he gets the written law, he gets the oral law, and he gets all the various components of Torah, and that gets transmitted generation to generation, like the Mishnah, like the Talmud, like the Halacha. We have the Kabbalah as well. But it's very different in a few important ways. First of all, it's arcane. It's esoteric. It's not intended for everyone. It's known only to the very few scholars on the highest level of knowledge and greatness, and it's transmitted from teacher to student in secrecy. The content is very advanced. It's very mysterious. And the whole subject is shrouded in mystery because it is hidden. Unlike the revealed Torah, as it's called, which is intended for everyone, and we are coaxed to try to disseminate it as widely as possible to the whole nation, the Kabbalah is deliberately limited in its dissemination. Now, the word Kabbalah itself means acceptance. What that means is that the essence of Kabbalah is that it's not intellectually or rationally deductible. The body, the content of Kabbalah, is not something that you can access with logic. Perhaps the revealed Torah, if you work hard enough, you can arrive at the conclusions of the Torah logically, rationally, via deductive cognitive methods. Which is why, by the way, we find a lot of the dicta of Torah are found in all kinds of different societies, all kinds of different countries and peoples and cultures arrive at the same conclusion because if you think straight, if you think clearly, if you use your intelligence, it's quite likely that you will arrive at many of the Torah's conclusions. The revealed Torah, that is. The definition of Kabbalah is Kabbalah. It's acceptance. The only way to actually understand it is if you receive it from a teacher 
from tradition. There's a nice trivia in this. The English word cabal, meaning like a secret clique or a faction or a fraternity, derives etymologically from the word Kabbalah. So over the course of the history of the development or the revealing or the unveiling of Kabbalah, this remained fixed, namely that the only way to properly study this subject is via a teacher who received it from a teacher, who received it from a teacher, who received it from Moses, who received it from Elijah, who received it from an angel. It has to be traditionally conveyed not intellectually or rationally so. Now, even once the Kabbalah is committed to writing, there's many books of Kabbalah. The essence is still Kabbalah, that the acceptance of this part of Torah is only done from a teacher. Now, what is the content of this hidden Torah? What are these secrets of Torah that are found in the vast corpus of Kabbalah? So I want to begin with big picture definitions and then get down to more specifics. Rabbi Chaim Volazhiner, who was the primary disciple of the Goan of Vilna, he defined Kabbalah as follows. Pnimius nishmas hatorah kedosha. Pnimius means the internal essence, the soul of the holy Torah. The inner sanctums of Torah is the Kabbalistic Torah. Just like a man is a hybrid of a body that you could see. And you have a soul, which is like the software, which is invisible. Torah, in general, too, has a body and a soul. And the revealed Torah, the part you could see, well, that's the revealed Torah. Well, what's the part that you cannot see, but really is the foundation, the underlayer that is powering the entire system? Well, that's the Kabbalah. The revealed Torah is the Torah's body, and the hidden Torah is the Torah's soul. That's the first definition that we have. The second definition, and these are not mutually exclusive, but there's different ways of looking at it, is given to us by Rabbi Chaim Vital, the primary disciple and the disseminator of the teachings of the Arizal, who is the greatest teacher and publicizer of Kabbalah. He explains Kabbalah thusly, and he talks about the idea of a hierarchy of worlds, the idea that we have the world that we live in now, and that there's higher spheres and higher dimensions. Our world is an infinitesimally small world compared to the many realms and worlds that are in existence. In fact, the Kabbalah delineates four worlds, Atzilus, Yitzira, Berea, and Asiya, and these are in descending levels of, of spiritual purity. So we have four different worlds or general worlds. And each world has a Torah that is formatted to it. So perhaps you've heard the term pardes, which means orchard. But pardes, the four letters, the four Hebrew letters that comprise the word pardes, stand for pshat, rem, is drash, and sod. Pshat is the simple understanding, Rem is are the hints, Drash is the allegorical, and so does the secret parts. We have four dimensions of Torah corresponding to the four dimensions of existence in these four different worlds. So just like our world is the most crude, coarse, mundane of these four worlds, the Torah that we have in the revealed world is also the most crude, mundane version of Torah, and then If you go up a level, you have a more sublime, more spiritual, more refined world, and that has a comparatively more refined Torah, and so on. The four levels of Torah, going from the simple interpretation to the hidden interpretation, correspond to the four levels of worlds. Now, this insight, I think, gives new meaning to the whole concept of Sinai. He was talking about the sign of revelation. Moses goes up to the mountain, transcends to the heavenly sphere, goes to negotiate with God and the angels, and brings the Torah down to us. By this definition, it's not just that Moshe is taking like a funnel and just transporting the Torah that exists in heaven and bringing it here. It's much more than that. It's adapting the Torah from its heavenly origins and heavenly spheres 
to our world and to our human frames of reference. My grandfather used to always give the following example. You know, the Talmud talks about what happens if my ox goes into your backyard and gores your cow to death. And then we go, we're following the carnage, and we find that the ox has gored the cow to death, but the cow is pregnant, and now the calf is also dead. And we don't know, did the ox gore the cow when it was pregnant, and thus it killed the calf as well? Or maybe the cow gave birth, and the calf, the calf died for some other reason, and therefore I'm not liable for the death of your calf, only for the death of your cow. That's what our Talmud discusses, and it gives us the Torah on this particular dilemma. In the higher realms, in the upper spheres, in the higher dimensions, there is no discussion of an ox goring a pregnant cow and finding the dead calf. It's a higher realm of existence, and thus is a higher realm of Torah. The essence, the holiness of the Torah is the same, regardless of which worlds it is. But it's the formatting. The formatting, the veneer, the facade of Torah changes relative to which world. Kabbalah is the study of Torah of the higher realms. When you study Kabbalah, you're trying to study the same Torah that we have, but what does that Torah look in a spiritual environment of these higher worlds. Now, another important disclaimer slash prerequisite is that when we talk about Kabbalah, that catchphrase really includes a lot more than one distinct form of study. We have what's called the theoretical Kabbalah, which is almost like the map of the spiritual world or even to understand the essence of things like angels and creation and the like. And then you have the more practical aspects of Kabbalah, like, like trying to meditate and trying to think about certain things and trying to focus on certain words to be able to attain a high level of consciousness via Kabbalah. There's the magical or practical Kabbalah today, we really don't know anything about this. It's almost universally peddled by charlatans and snake oil salesmen. And I think today the most common form of Kabbalah is what we call Ta'ameha HaMitzvos, the reasons for the mitzvos, which is like giving a Kabbalistic tinge to the commandments and to the stories of Torah and the rest of the Torah literature. So that's Kabbalah. It sounds really interesting. Where do I find a comprehensive guide? Where do I start? Give me the 101 of Kabbalah. I'm ready to begin. It's not so easy. Everything in this entire field is hidden. The material is hidden. The sources are hidden. And there's a tradition, even when you do quote Kabbalistic ideas publicly, you don't identify the source. You say, well, it says in the holy books, Svarim HaKadoshim. In the holy books it says, i.e. in the Kabbalah it says this, but I'm not going to tell you where to find it. That's the tradition. If you're going to quote something selectively, you do it in a way that it can't really be traced. You can't follow the breadcrumbs back to the sources. Kabbalah also has its own dictionary. It has its own parlance and, and lingo. It has its whole slate of, of, of words and definitions and concepts and introductions. It's very difficult to break into the subject. Nevertheless, this is our pursuit of Torah 101. We're going to try to give an overview. So the first place, of course, you would look to try to find Kabbalah is in the Talmud of the Mishnah. Of course, we know the Talmud. We spoke about it at length. It's completed and sealed circa 6th century. And if you look through it, you find a few, not many, a few overt references to Kabbalistic teachings. So we spoke about the whole idea of Agatha teachings, which may be masked Kabbalah. But there are some overt discussions in the Talmud about 
Kabbalistic literature and Kabbalistic powers and knowledge and ideas, things that we have absolutely no access to today. So, for example, there are several descriptions about a book called Sefer Yitzira, the book of creation, i.e. the manual that you would need to create an entirely new world. It's a very thin volume. It's only a couple of hundred words. According to tradition, it's authored by Abraham. Some say not by Abraham, by by Rabbi Akiva, or maybe authored by Abraham, but organized by Rabbi Akiva. And the Talmud mentions this a few times. So, for example, the Talmud tells us in the book of Sanhedrin on page 65b, quote, Rava bara gavra, which literally means Rava, one of the sages of the Talmud, he created a man and he sent him to his friend. And they were, he was there visiting and this friend started talking to this man, this golem that Rava created and the man was not responding. And he says, okay, it looks like you're a created man. You're not real. You're not created by God. You're created by humans because you cannot speak. A human could create a golem or a golem, but a human cannot infuse within his creation in, in his human created man. A human cannot infuse within that the power of speech. That's only the handiwork of God. So this friend of Rava tells him, ah, tells to this person, to this messenger, go back to where you came from. Go back to your dust. How did he create a man? Says Rashi, Al Yidei Sefer Yitzira. Via this book, Sefer Yitzira, the book of creation, the step-by-step guidelines, the idiot's guide to creating, to mimicking, so to speak, what God did. Elsewhere, the Talmud tells us, two sages of the Talmudic era, every Friday, they would study together. Well, what would they study? Would they study Talmud or Mishnah or Scripture? No, they would study Sefer Yitzira, the book of formation of creation. And they would create a fat calf and they would eat it on Shabbat. What's for dinner? Let me go to the House of Scholarship. Let me go to the Academy. Let me study and I'll create a calf. This is clearly access to knowledge and wisdom and insights that we have absolutely no access to today. The Talmud tells us, how did Bitzalel get the role of building the tabernacle? Says the Talmud, Book of Brachos, page 55a. Yodeya haya Bitzalel. Bitzalel knew letzaref osios, to combine letters that through them, i.e. via this process, heaven and earth were created. How did God create heaven and earth? Via combinations of letters. What does that mean? I don't know. But Bitzalel knew, and that's why when he created a new world via the tabernacle, he did it in the same way that God created the original world, the heaven and earth world. Bitzalel made a replica of that via combinations of letters. Again, knowledge, information, skills that we have no connection to. This passage, Parsha, it tells us of Moshe killing an Egyptian who was striking a Hebrew. Well, how did he kill him? So if you look very carefully at the text, and Rashi, of course, highlights it, that he killed him via speech. Says Rashi, he killed him with the shame, how forward with the ineffable name of God. Moshe already at that time, as a young lad, he knew how to deploy the name of God in a way that could act as a, a neutralization of this Egyptian guard. The Talmud tells us in the book of Sukkah, page 28a, it's giving the eulogy of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, and it talks about all of his knowledge. He knew all of scripture. Okay, we'd expect that. He knew all of Mishnah and Talmud. We'd expect that as well. All the halacha, all the agadata, all the precise readings, the subtle readings of Torah and, and scribes, all the arguments, all the syllogisms, everything. He knew it all. And then it continues. He knew the conversations of the ministering angels. He knew the conversations of demons. He knew the conversations of palm trees. When the palm trees are flowing, blowing in the wind, he was able to interpret what that meant. Obviously, it's describing his Torah knowledge, and he had access 
to realms and dimensions of Torah that are totally beyond anything that we can fathom. Finally, another example, and again, these are overt examples of access to knowledge in Torah found in the Talmud and the Midrashic literature that clearly speak about other kinds of, of Torah that we really don't have a connection to. The Talmud tells us about Rabbi Akiva on every jot and tittle of the cantillation marks of the letters, he was able to deduce piles and piles of laws. What are these piles and piles of laws? Of course, we have no idea. So those are some of the anecdotes and individual references of Kabbalah in the Talmud. But besides for that, there are several pages in the book of Hadidah which are dedicated to the study and the teaching of Kabbalah. Now, it's interesting that we have several pages about Kabbalah. You're like, okay, that's a good place to start. But what it talks about, what it talks about primarily are the prohibitions against teaching and studying it. So it tells us if you want to talk about Misa Beratius, which is the account of creation, you cannot do it with more than one person. And if you want to speak about the account of the chariot, i.e. Ezekiel chapter 1, that you can't even do it to an individual. Unless that individual is so wise and you give them a few hints and they could piece the pieces together in their head, they could put the puzzle by themselves, they could assemble the puzzle, only then is it permissible to talk about the Maise Merkava, the account of the chariot. And the Talmud fact goes on to say how all the sages studied it, they were too young, so they couldn't study it. And when they finally did study it, it created such an uproar and the heavens stopped and all the angels stopped. It's clearly trying to convey to us the principle that the study of this portion of Torah is something which is not done willy-nilly. It's not done just to every, to every Joe Schmo. It is something which must be handled very delicately. Now, the Talmud defines Kabbalah as ma'aseh merkava, which what we could call perhaps theology, the study of God's chariot. Again, it's chapter one of Ezekiel. It's the first two chapters of the Rambam's Yesod, the Torah Foundations of the Torah. And the second part of it is called Maiseberatius, the account of creation, the study not of God himself, but God's handiwork. The Talmud also refers to the concept of ten sephiros, the ten spheres, the ten emanations, the ten lights. What that means is, I don't know exactly, but these are the ten different, so to speak, modes of interface between God and the world. This, again, according to the consensus of the Kabbalists, this is how God interacts with the world. And we're told, in addition, in all the Kabbalistic literature, that all the tens are connected, the ten utterances of Genesis, the ten tests of Abraham, the ten plagues, of course, of Egypt, the ten commandments of Sinai. These are the ten revelations, so to speak, that God has with this world. We're also told in the Talmud, again, this is just hinted to in the Talmud, what exactly means, it's not clear at all. It talks about the seven heavens and the vast distances between each one of them, what's above them, what's below them. Even the great commentators throw up their hands, admit defeat, and they acknowledge that it is beyond their comprehension. And the perception that we pick up is that what the Kabbalah demonstrates is that there's so much more that is hidden beyond what is revealed. It's almost like the human body. The human body, we see it. Oh, it looks like, you know, there's a few organs a few working parts, but when you realize what's actually happened, all the billions and trillions of cells and how it's all working and it's all, all connected, it's all networked, of course, that's a much more sophisticated way to look at a human. And the people that study it, they really understand what's really happening, but even they don't understand it to its full extent. You know, there's the, the brain. How does the brain work? We're kind of scratching the surface of understanding it. You know, we could put an MRI machine and see what parts of the brain are actually being uh, being triggered, and that's how we know, or we could identify certain portions, certain certain areas, certain regions of the brain based upon you know certain emotions or certain inputs uh, and the like. 
but we really don't know how it's working. We could say that the Kabbalah is similar to this. You know, we have the, the Torah that we see, and it is very, very vast and very complicated. But then once you kind of look beneath the hood and scratch beneath the surface and start getting into the soul, so to speak, of Torah, to all the parts that are not visible, you see how everything is connected and you see how much more sophisticated and complicated and advanced and beautiful it is once you go to that realm. So, for example, you know, this whole idea of of garment and body and soul and body and the parallels, how everything's paralleled. We have microcosms, this world, and then the more advanced world, the more advanced world, and they're all similar, but each formatted to their own way of, of, of referencing. So, for example, man is created the image of God. What does that even mean? There's an entire butcher in that subject. How every word of Torah really covers everything. The Gona Vilna famously said, all 613 mitzvot are actually hinted into the first word of the Torah, Bereshis. There's a certain interconnectivity that's found once you go beneath the surface. So we have this entire body of knowledge. It's hidden. It's transmitted orally from teacher to student. It's done in a way that us as outsiders really have no window to see what's actually happening. All we have is these perhaps fleeting glimpses of these ideas being portrayed, discussed, but clearly in a way that we don't understand. And of course, you know, that raises the question, you know, wh- why Why is this relevant to us at all? Why was it even relevant to them, to antiquity? What is the role, so to speak, that Kabbalah plays in Jewish life, or certainly in Jewish life in antiquity? So the Ramam gives us maybe an avenue to understand this. He tells us that if you were a prophet, a prophet by definition is someone who's trying to transcend to a different dimension, trying to have a portal, a connection between this world and the higher spheres. That's the definition of a prophet. Well, how would a prophet go about doing that via this railway, this network that connects our world to the spiritual world, i.e., The Torah of the Kabbalah can transpose a person from being, so to speak, a citizen of this world alone to becoming a citizen of the higher worlds and thus having a connection on that level. The Ram says that the way someone achieves prophecy is, first of all, they have to make themselves worthy of being a vessel for that kind of communication. They have to refine their character. They have to be in total control, total self-control, never be controlled by the Yitzhara, be in perfect body as well. It's an important prerequisite. Total humility, all the good characteristics, and then enter the pardis. Then enter the orchard and take the train, so to speak, to the next sphere, to the higher dimensions. Now, the Ramam is very cautious of the Talmud's warning not to teach this publicly. And the Talmud, again, Almost all of its discussion about Kabbalah, at least its direct discussion of Kabbalah, orient around the prohibition of studying it, around the impenetrability of the subject. So the Ramam is very careful about that, and he gives this analogy that you have the meat and potatoes, and you have the dessert. First, make sure that you your belly is filled with meat and potatoes, i.e. with the revealed Torah, and only then can you even think about trying to get some dessert. And even dessert, Talmud explains that a little bit of dessert is great. Too much, it could actually be harmful. So it's like the perfect cap, the perfect dessert of a wonderful banquet. But if that's the only thing you're eating, then you're going to have uh, negative consequences. The Talmud, in fact, tells us a story of the Pardes gone wrong. It talks about Rabbi Kiva and his friends, his colleagues, that entered the Pardes. They entered the orchard. And they were trying to access a higher level of consciousness, 
And like we know, there's different levels of prophecies, direct communication, only Moshe had that. There's via images and trances, all the rest of the prophets. There's prophetic voices like the Baskal, Revelation of Elijah, other angels, Ruach HaKodesh, Holy Spirit. Rabbi Kiva and his friends are trying to access a higher level of consciousness and thus a higher level of prophecy, and they enter the Pardis. And it's a very striking description of what they encountered and what they saw. But the bottom line is that three of them died, and each died in their own way. Ben Azai, he got too close. He saw things that he shouldn't have seen. He glanced at things that he shouldn't have looked at, and he died. Ben Zoma, he also went too close, and he didn't die, but he went mad. He went crazy. And finally, Acher, who was a great sage, he got too close, and he went to Rye. He chopped down the saplings of the orchard. He divested, so to speak, the creation from the creator, and he became a heretic. And only Rabbi Kiva was able to enter in peace and leave in peace as well. So, of course, this story demonstrates how playing with fire could sometimes lead to injury. And these are giants, tremendous sages. Colleagues of Rabbi Kiva, they went too far and they got burned, all the more so for us, who we don't know anything. Our, our, our bellies are still empty, even for the meat potatoes. And thus, this this should serve as a warning for us. Now, one of Rabbi Akiva's primary students is very central to the entire subject of Kabbalah, and that is Rabbi Shimon, more commonly known as Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And we know the story. He spoke against... Uh, the the tyrannical Roman regime. He had to flee for his life, and for 13 years, he hides out in a cave, and he is subsisting on a carrot tree and a stream of water. Him and his son, they bury themselves in the sand all the way up to their necks, and they have visitations from Elijah. This is told in the Talmud, the Book of Shabbos, page 33b. And according to tradition, during these 13 years, they delve into the hidden mystical levels of Torah, and the current tradition, Elijah, the prophet, teaches them the Kabbalah. Again, this idea that Kabbalah is something that you could not develop on your own, you have to accept it from tradition. And again, according to tradition, at this time, he wrote the Zohar, the essential work of Kabbalah, even though the book is not published until a millennium later. Besides for the Zohar, we have other books of Kabbalah from that time. Rabbi Nechunya ben Hakana, he, according to tradition, wrote the Sefer Habayir and the Pirkei Hechalos Rabasi, other books as well. And then we have a, a period, really, where for basically a thousand years, these books and these traditions don't really surface. And for the uninitiated, it seems like there's a gap, there's a break, there is a flaw, so to speak, in the transmission. You have books purported to be authored by sages of the Mishnah, and they don't surface for about a thousand years afterwards. And then in the medieval time, there's this, this surge of Kabbalah. You have new works. Of course, you have the commentary of the Ramban and the Torah, which has a lot of Kabbalah in it. And, of course, the skeptic has to raise the question, wait a minute, what actually happened in those thousand years? So I think it's important to stress the following. According to Torah law, the study of Kabbalah must be done in secret. And it can only be done by people who have their belly filled with meat and potatoes, the greatest sages of the land. So if things worked as intended, you would have vast time times of history where the study of Kabbalah, the writings of the Kabbalah, the traditions of the Kabbalah, the wisdom of Kabbalah will not be visible. That is a sign of the system working, not a system breaking down. So I think... The skeptics, of course, have a lot of reason to be skeptical. But 
if you just take the Mishnah and you just game it out, that is exactly what you would expect. So in fact, the the emergence, so to speak, of the Kabbalah, the medieval time, that is a bigger question than the dark period, so to speak, of the lack of access or of, of any visible manifestation of Kabbalah from the Mishnahic or Talmudic era until it becomes really big in the medieval time. Now, the Ramban's Kabbalah is very fascinating because if you look at its introduction to his commentary, you do get a little bit of a flavor of his approach. He talks about the Torah before Sinai. He talks about this idea that the Torah existed in this higher level, black fire on top of white fire, that the whole Torah is just names of God. Moshe was given the Torah on all its dimensions, both as the names of God and as it's spelled out for us. And then true to form, he ends his introduction with a very stern warning against trying to understand his commentary without a Kabbalistic teacher. So he's right. So he's saying, like, I'm going to write lots of Kabbalah in my commentary. But I'm making a pact. I'm adjuring you. And I'm giving you a good advice. You want to read my book? Do it. Great. But don't try to postulate, to posit your theories, to think your thoughts in a matter of all the hints that I'm going to write in the hidden matters of Torah unless you have a Kabbalah, a tradition from an elder who is on is someone who understands who himself has received the traditions. The Ramban, in fact, is just spelling it out that there is a tradition and the tradition is unbroken, but it's hidden. And I'm going to write some stuff. I'm going to give you little hints and you will be led astray if you're trying to understand that without access, without plugging in to that tradition. And he ends off his introduction with the famous quote, something that's greater than you, don't try to study something that is stronger than you. Don't try to investigate something that is beyond you. Don't try to know something that's covered from you. Don't ask whatever you do have access to, whatever you did inherit. That's what you should study. And you should not have any business dealing with the hidden. In fact, in Art Scroll, they recently translated the Ramban's commentary on the Torah and there are sections that they write, I'm sorry, we ain't translating this for you. You are on your own, of course, pursuant to the Ramban's warning. In the late 13th century, the Zohar was published in Spain by Rabbi Moshe Dilian. He publishes this vast work, this vast commentary on the Torah, the Zohar, and he attributes it to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who lived more than a thousand years earlier. And this is the fundamental book of Kabbalah, a wide-ranging, voluminous Kabbalistic commentary on the Torah written in Aramaic. It's very complicated. It's very arcane. It's not easy to make sense of. And then we have a book, and it's published, and it's available in your local Jewish bookstore. And the person who discovers it claims that it's authored by Bishon Bar Yechai. Now, obviously, that will lead certainly the academic skeptics to claim that, no, it was actually Rabbi Delian himself who authored it, and he ascribed it to an earlier sage to sell more copies. Of course, that's what the skeptic would say. And you know what? There is a big question, because we don't really have a clear explanation of how Rabbi Moshe Delian actually got the Zohar. And there are some fanciful legends, and we don't really know how to separate truth from fiction, but here's the critical point. All the traditional Jewish sources, from the Arizal to the rest of the Kabbalists, to the Gona Vilna, to the Sephardic giants, to the Hasidic giants, everyone, almost everyone, accepts this as absolute fact. So much so that according to some, it is actually part of what is necessary to be a believing Jew. It's almost like part of the 13 principles to believe in Torah. And to believe in the legitimacy of Torah and the divinity of Torah and the veracity of Torah. And part of that is that the Zohar was authored by Rabbi Shem Baruch 
And again, with the exception of a small sect of Yemenite Jews who refuse to accept anything that's not found in the Rambam explicitly, everyone from all stripes and all strata and all spectrum of the whole nation accepts this as authoritative. And again, for us, it's a little bit unsettling. Where is the paper trail? How come we don't find an earlier version of this book? How was it transmitted from generation to generation without us being able to follow the paper trail? And the Arizal, he explains, he's like, well, anyone who is legitimately a student of Kabbalah is someone who either studies directly with angels or someone who studied from somebody, from somebody, from somebody who studied directly with angels. And thus, the claim of Kabbalah is that there is some supernatural way of studying this and transmitting this. And that would explain why you would not find uh, any references uh, to it. And again, in the Arizal's writing, he makes this point very clear. True Kabbalah is not intellectually derived. Only books and traditions and teachings that stem either from predecessors who studied from angels or people who had divine communications themselves, only those are to be studied. Regardless of... This whole discussion as to the authorship of the Zohar, at the time, the Zohar became very widely popular, but it's opaque. It seems to have little structure or system, and it's not exactly clear how do we interpret this Kabbalistic body of knowledge, how do we interpret it, how do we understand it, how do we process it, and that's why it's very critical to connect the Zohar to the most famous teacher, disseminator, systematizer, organizer, codifier of Kabbalah, namely the Arizal, Rabbi Isaac Luria, 1534 to 1572. One of the most fascinating people of our history. He only lived to be 38 years old. And he's operating on a totally different level. He's able to read on people's foreheads everything that they did. He's able to walk around northern Israel and spot the exact places where great sages were buried. In fact, today you go to northern Israel, you see all these grave sites of famous rabbis. How did we know where these people are? Because of the Arizal. Someone asked him, why didn't you write a book? And he says, I'm discovering secrets of Torah so fast, it's too fast for me to write it. There's one famous story where his student heard him murmuring in his sleep and he's leaning in trying to listen to him. And when he leans in, the Arizal wakes up and he says, well, what were they teaching you in heaven? So he said to him like this, he says, if I were to try to convey to you what I just studied and I spoke nonstop for 80 years, I would still not be able to convey to you everything that I studied. And again, this is something that sounds so fanciful to us. It sounds so unbelievable to us. But again, this is something which is accepted universally. And that reason himself, like every every night would go study by one of the heavenly academies. One night by Rabbi Yishmael, one night by Rabbi Akiva, of course, one night by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai. Elijah the prophet comes to study with him. For us, it's very hard for us to accept that rationally, but that is the definition of Kabbalah. It's the part of Torah study that cannot be understood rationally. The knowledge, the logic that requires to process this is not logical, and there's no way to get it unless you have the Kabbalah, the tradition. The stories about the Arizal are really wild. If you want to listen to more of it, I did an episode on the Jewish History Podcast on the Arizal. Now, for our purposes, he totally revolutionized the study of Kabbalah. He's the one who gave Kabbalah its system, its framework, its lingo, its parlance, its vocabulary. Unlike the Mishnah that tells us to be very careful with the study of Kabbalah and to not teach it, he encouraged the study of Kabbalah. Now, of course, provided that it's not in the proper context with students that are God-fearing, with students that are committed. But 
there was a shift in attitude, namely that we have to study the Kabbalah. In fact, his student, Rabbi Chaim Vital, said if, if you study just the revealed Torah and not the hidden Torah, you are perfecting like the body of Torah, but not the soul of Torah. Well, then you will only get the reward of the body, not the reward of the soul, i.e. you'll be locked out of the afterlife. Moreover, the idea was reinforced again and again that the only way to hasten the arrival of the Messiah is via the study of Torah. What kind of Torah? Specifically, the Kabbalistic Torah. Of course, again, everyone's acknowledging it has to be in the proper context and settings with the right teacher, with the right prerequisites. But nevertheless, the focus is flipped. Instead of trying to say, how do we teach as little of this as possible? How do we teach as much of it as possible? in the right settings and context with the right people, with the right prerequisites, etc. Now, the Arizal himself did not author any books. The writings of the Arizal were penned by his chosen student and successor, Rabbi Chaim Vital. Now, Rabbi Chaim Vital, in this introduction to this work called Eitz Chaim, the Tree of Life, or Shimon Sha'arim, the Eight Gates, he writes that this is a fraction of, of what he actually got from the Arizal, but this is a magisterial work of Kabbalah, and this is the framework to understand all of the Zohar, and it's broken down into eight different sections, Shar HaHakdamos, which means literally the gate of introductions, Shar Ma'amori Rashbi, the gate of the statements of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yichai, the gate of the statements of our sages, the gate of verses, the gate of the intentions, which refer to prayers, the gate of mitzvos, the gate of Ruach HaKodesh, which Ruach HaKodesh means the Holy Spirit, and finally, the gate of reincarnation. When the Rizal passed, he confided in his students that his teachings have not been completely conveyed, and there will be great giants of Kabbalah that will emerge and will continue his teachings. And indeed, soon afterwards, four pillars of Kabbalah appeared on the Jewish scene, namely Lutzato, Ramchal, the Baal Shem Tov, of course, the father of the Hasidic movement, the Gona of Vilna, and the Rashash Rabbi Shalom Sharabi. Each one of them had their own school, so to speak, of Kabbalah and their own way of understanding Kabbalah. But Kabbalah really funnels, so to speak, from Rabbi Shem Chai to the Arizal, and everything really sticks to that protocol. Of course, there are skeptics. There are always skeptics. And certainly in his day, the Arizal had his share of people that were dubious to his claims. But after this quartet affirmed everything that the Arizal said, there is scarcely a contingency in Judaism that questions it. Now, I want to give an example of what we mean when we talk about Kabbalah, just the actual kind of core study of, of, of what this subject is about. And I feel like this idea is the point of departure for this form of study. So we have a dilemma, a foundational, fundamental dilemma or paradox in our belief. And that is the question of how can there be coexistence between the infinity, i.e. God, and finite? Of course, we believe in an infinite creator. That's the Almighty. And finite creations. But definitionally, they are mutually exclusive. If the infinity exists, and of course, that is supremely logical because finite existence has a beginning and cannot create itself. Well, if that's true then how could there be room for any finite existence? If we believe our definition of God, how do we exist? Now, this question is often restated as follows. If God knows what we will choose, well, how do we have free will to choose it? How can man, or frankly, anything that is not God, exist if God exists? So in essence, this is the question of what's the secret of creation? So Aristotle talked about this, and the Greeks talked about it, and the Kabbalists give their answer. Now, it's important to stress, this answer is alluded to in the Zohar, but the exact understanding of this explanation is unclear. 
So the Arizal said, I will explain to you what the Zohar means, and I will explain to you the answer to this question. And how do I know it? Because Elijah the prophet told it to me. In the beginning, there was just God. There was just the infinity. In Kabbalistic parlance, there was just the Ein Sof, the endless. Then the infinity decided to create finite existence. So what did the infinity do? The infinity contracted right at the center of the infinity and allowed for a void. And into that void, the infinity shone a perfect ray of light, a perfect ray of infinity. And that formed all the various spheres of existence from the more spiritual ones to our world. Further, this ray of infinity that was shown into this void that the infinity created when the infinity contracted, that built receptacles or kalim or vessels to accept that light. But the light was too strong and it shattered those vessels and the vessels broke and they created new levels of existence. But the light was still too strong and it's still too intense. And thus, those vessels kept on breaking and kept on creating new levels of existence. And each one of them is a different sphere of existence. That's how the book Eitz Chaim, the authoritative book of the Arizal's Kabbalah, begins with this concept that we call Tzimtzum in Kabbalistic parlance. Where does this come from? It comes from Elijah the prophet. Does this resolve our question? I don't know. By definition, we say that in a world of infinity, there is no limitations and therefore there is no time and there is no center. And how does infinity contract? Does this make our understanding of theology easier or harder? How exactly we process the Kabbalistic interpretation of this problem, I don't think we've resolved it. Did the infinity contract or did something that it radiates, is that what contracted? Maybe that's the way to solve the problem. But how could something which is infinite have a ray? How does it have any radiation? It's not exactly clear. But here's an important principle. And this, again, will, will reinforce why this subject is so maddeningly difficult and impenetrable and why if we really, really want to study it, we have to be prepared. The Gona Vilna and the Ramchal, both of them said the following. Absolutely everything that the Arizal said is allegorical. If you believe it literally, it's heresy. And this is really the problem. Because we're trying to explain the infinite. And the only tools of reference, the only frames of reference, the only examples that we could give to create an allegory, to create an understanding, a framework, an analogy, they're all finite. And we're trying to use finite tools to explain an infinite existence. And that's the problem. So how do we truly understand it? We have this explanation. We have this this framework. And it doesn't make any sense to us. And we're not sure what it means. And now we're told it's got to be an allegory. If you don't believe it's an allegory, well, that's heresy. Well, but the allegory makes no sense because the allegory is in finite terms. And the concept I'm trying to explain here is infinite. So here is another important point. To truly understand this level of Kabbalah, you have to change your existence. You have to physiologically alter the kind of human that you are. Your soul is spiritual. Your soul can understand spiritual frames of reference. Your body cannot. The only way to truly understand Kabbalah, and we're talking about this, the theoretical Kabbalah, and the very first point of departure for this study, the only way to do that is if you start seeing the world via the lenses of your soul. 
And the Gaon of Vilna understood it. He said about himself that he understood it. He said Ramchal, Arizal, Chaim Vital all understood it. But most of us, it really is truly beyond us. Because the problem that we're coming to solve, the questions we're coming to resolve, remain unanswered even after we have the Kabbalistic framework to try to address it. And that's why the ancient Kabbalists would try to live a monastic life, would try to eschew physical pleasures, would live lives of pain and privation, roll in snow, have protracted fast days. Of course, these are not ideas that we're told to do in Jewish life. But what they are trying to do is to subject and subjugate the finite parts of their existence to develop new frames of reference to be able to see reality with spiritual frames of reference. And thus, they have to get rid of, they have to denigrate the, their physical bodies to be able to transcend to this highest level of, of human consciousness. Of course, that's not really for us. I think there's still room for us to dip our toe in maybe the softer areas of Kabbalah, which we call it Kabbalah light. Uh, I think the idea of reincarnation is something that we can connect to. It doesn't make sense to us. The idea that we have a second chance, the idea of our soul being the body to our body's garment, the idea of the afterlife, the idea that our soul can exist after it is removed from our body and the fact the Almighty takes the soul and says you have another chance, let me give you another garment, another body for you to accomplish your mission. If you look at Rashi's commentary to the birth and uh, gestation story of Jacob and Esau, when Rebecca goes to the prophet, the prophet tells her there's two nations within you. And Rashi points out that the way it's it's spelled Shnei Goyim Bevitnech, there's two nations within you. It's spelled Shnei Geim, two proud ones within you. It says Rashi, Ze Rebbe Antoninus. This is a reference to Rebbe Judah the Prince and to Antoninus, the Roman emperor who was a confidant of Rebbe Judah the Prince. Say the Kabbalistic literature, what Rashi is telling you, he's hinting it, of course, that Jacob was reincarnated as Roger the Prince and Esav was given a second chance and maybe he succeeded in the second chance when he was reincarnated as the Roman Emperor. Now, there are, like we said, other ways to connect to the Kabbalistic literature. There is the Kabbalah light, we could call it, in my Parsha podcast, I try to sprinkle some Kabbalah light into understanding the text and the stories and the narratives of, of the Torah in a little bit of a deeper way, again, with full acknowledgement that we're, we're just really trying to say words. We don't really understand what they mean, and we're, we're very cognizant of that fact. We freely admit that we're not experts, but we're just trying to have a deeper understanding of Torah, a deeper understanding of, of the mitzvot, a deeper understanding of the personalities and the narratives of the Torah. Call ourselves, perhaps, Kabbalah curious. But I think if it's the soul of the Torah, it's important for us to know about it, to have a little bit of understanding of what it means and what, where its place, so to speak, in Torah is. If we truly want to understand the Torah in general, it's important for us to have at least a passing literacy of what this subject means and the one thing we can be certain of. We spoke a little bit about Kabbalah, but this subject is so vast. It's so unfathomably huge. We're trying to get a basic understanding, a framework of this important part of Torah, the hidden Torah, the Kabbalah. I thank you all for listening. My email address is rabbiwalbajiba.com. Send me any questions, any comments, and of course, any feedback.